This episode is sponsored by Squarespace. I used Squarespace to build both Basics with Babish and BingingWithBabish.com. On the sites, you'll find recipes, equipment lists, other news, and updates. All beautifully designed, if I do say so myself. Get 10% off your first Squarespace order by visiting squarespace.com babish. All right, let's start off with that most simple of snacks to eat while watching stuff, popcorn. But not just any popcorn, we're gonna add some fun seasonings, starting with za'atar. We're tiny whisking together one tablespoon of the toasty, zesty Middle Eastern spice with one tablespoon of kosher salt. Then as for the actual poppin', we're placing three tablespoons of coconut oil in a large stock pot, heating over medium-high heat, and adding two or three kernels of unpopped popcorn. These are gonna sort of act as the canaries in our popcorn coal mine. When they start to pop, the oil is fully heated and we're gonna add a third of a cup of popcorn kernels. Toss them around in the fat to coat them evenly, remove them from the heat and cover them, letting them rest for 30 seconds. Then we're placing them back over medium-high heat and shaking them constantly until the kernels are popped. This should take anywhere from one to two minutes and is a perfect opportunity to make silly faces in the reflection of your pot lid. Okay, that's a little scary. Oh God, no, that's terrifying. Keep it moving until you're down to one to two pops per second, occasionally cracking the lid to vent steam, take it off the heat, and you'll be delighted to find a pot of as perfectly popped popcorn as is presently possible. There are precious few seconds that your popcorn is going to be receptive to toppings, so it's imperative that you coat them immediately with the seasoning of your choice. You can also drizzle a few tablespoons of melted butter over the popcorn for even better stickage. Add a good sprinkle of seasoning, toss it around, add some more, get everybody as evenly coated as possible, and there you have it, seasoned popcorn, burdened with the tangy, nutty flavor of za'atar. But what if you're in the mood for something a bit on the spicier side? Might I suggest gochugaru? This time we're combining one tablespoon of salt, one teaspoon onion powder, one teaspoon sugar, half a teaspoon of black sesame seeds, and two teaspoons of gochugaru, or Korean chili flakes. Tea whisk that together until homogenous, and this time we're going to pop our popcorn using a mix of two tablespoons of vegetable oil and one tablespoon of sesame oil. Toss together as before, and you got yourself a big old bowl of spicy, sweet, savory snack and stuff. This one was my personal favorite, but a close second was a sweet spiced chai popcorn. This time we got two tablespoons of sugar, half a teaspoon of kosher salt, two teaspoons of cinnamon, half a teaspoon ginger, eighth of a teaspoon of clove, quarter teaspoon of ground cardamom, eighth of a teaspoon of allspice, and about a half teaspoon of freshly grated nutmeg, optional. Also a couple twists of freshly ground black pepper to round out the spice. This time we're back to coconut oil before popping and tossing our corn, and there you have it, a sweet popcorn that, I never thought I would say this, gives kettle corn a run for its money. Flavored popcorn is a super easy game day snack, but it's about as easy to make as it is filling. So why don't we take a crack at something a little more satisfying, Nashville hot chicken and waffle skewers. We're gonna start with a pound and a half of the boneless, skinless chicken of your choice. You can use dark or white meat. If you're using thighs like this, make sure you trim off all the excess fat and sinew, and then cut it into one to two inch bite-sized pieces which we're going to optionally brine in buttermilk for optimal juicy flavor tenderness. One and a half cups of buttermilk, one tablespoon of kosher salt, and a few twists of freshly ground black pepper. Tiny whisk to combine, drop the chicken inside, toss to coat, and refrigerate for at least eight hours. This is optional, but highly recommend. If you don't have the time or the inclination, you can go ahead and skip straight to the next step. In a wide bowl or pie plate, we're combining one and a half cups of flour, half a cup of cornstarch, one and a half tablespoons of salt, and one tablespoon of freshly ground black pepper. Miniature whisk that to combine, and that's the dry dredge for our chicken. The wet dredge is already half made. Straight to our butter chicken mixture, we're gonna add one large egg thoroughly beaten, along with a few dashes, about a tablespoon's worth of Louisiana-style hot sauce. Toss everything together until it is thoroughly combined. And then for extra craggly, crispy chicken crusts, we're going to dump about a tablespoon of the marinade into our dry mixture, tossing it around with a fork until it forms little crumbs, and then, shaking off excess marinade, we're gonna dump our chicken straight into the dry stuff. Tossing it around evenly coat and then letting it sit for like 10 minutes. This is going to help the coating adhere to the chicken during the frying process, which we're going to perform in about two quarts of peanut oil or the deep frying oil of your choice heated to 375 degrees Fahrenheit. Add the pieces of chicken in batches so as not to overcrowd and fry for anywhere from 12 to 15 minutes. 
flipping occasionally until the chicken is golden brown on the outside and registers 175 degrees Fahrenheit on the inside. Once it's done, it's best to drain on paper towels. This helps soak up excess oil and keeps the chicken crispier longer. Once you have rinsed and repeated with the remaining chicken, you can just stop there if you want plain old fried chicken and waffles. But if you're like me and you've got a girlfriend who craves spicy food, we can transform this into Nashville hot chicken. Into a very heat-proof bowl goes three tablespoons of cayenne pepper, half a teaspoon garlic powder, half a teaspoon paprika, and one tablespoon, oh, come on little guy, one tablespoon of light brown sugar, to which we're gonna add about a half a cup of the still ripping hot fry oil, hence the heat-proof bowl. Tiny whisk until it forms a devilishly red, extremely spicy looking paste, which we're going to generously slather all over our fried chicken bits. The cayenne pepper in this paste can be adjusted to your liking to make it more or less spicy, but if you ask me, proper Nashville hot chicken is spicy enough that you cannot eat it with a straight face. Rapidly blinking eyes, shallow breaths, and a flop sweat are signs that you've done your job correctly. Now with all this spice, it's nice to have something sweet, hence waffles. While the chicken stays warm in a low oven, we are combining one cup of all-purpose flour, a half teaspoon each kosher salt and baking soda, one teaspoon baking powder, one tablespoon of sugar, and one tablespoon of cornmeal in a medium bowl. Tiny whisk until homogenous, and then in a separate, smaller bowl, three quarters of a cup of room temperature buttermilk, half a teaspoon vanilla extract, four tablespoons unsalted butter melted and cooled, and one large room temperature egg. Now tiny whisk that until homogenous, add it to the dry stuff, and gently fold together. The gentlier, the better. Overmixed waffle or pancake batter results in gluten development, which results in tough, dense cakes, so don't worry about getting all the lumps out. Now it's time to bust out the old waffle iron, I'm going Belgian style, lubing generously with nonstick spray and loading up with half of our waffle batter. That's right, this recipe only makes two waffles, but that's all you're gonna need. Cook according to your waffle iron manufacturer's instructions, or until golden brown, crisp, and cooked through. Once you got your waffles made, it's a time to skewer. I'm gonna start by dividing the waffles into bite-sized pieces to accompany our bite-sized pieces of chicken. Makes sense, right? Then onto some long wooden or metal kebab skewers they go, alternating between chicken and waffle for a decorative flair. Skewer them up, stack them high, and that's all there is to it, a sweet, savory, spicy, handheld chicken and waffle delivery system. You could of course serve these with maple syrup, but I've got an even better idea. My bald-headed brother, Sean Evans, sent me a bottle of this stuff, his Hot Ones Hot Honey, and I think it's gonna be just right for what we got going on here. After all, what goes better with sweet and spicy than sticky? So there you have it, Nashville hot chicken and waffles drenched in spicy honey. This will undoubtedly satisfy the hotheads cheering on your favorite sports with you, but what about those seeking something sweet? To them, I humbly submit cannoli dip. First up, to make the dip in a medium bowl, we are combining four ounces of mascarpone cheese, or alternately, you can use cream cheese and four ounces of ricotta. To this, we're gonna add half a teaspoon of kosher salt, a quarter teaspoon of ground cinnamon, an optional, but I think very necessary, two tablespoons of amaretto, and half a cup of sifted powdered sugar. We're sifting because this will prevent a lumpy dip. Go ahead and regular size whisk this together, this is no job for tiny whisk, until it is smooth and homogenous and creamy and dippable. Then optionally, you can add a third of a cup of your preferred cannoli mix-ins. I like miniature chocolate chips, but you could use pistachios or hazelnuts or, I don't know, sprinkles for all I care. Once you got that all mixed up, you can cover and refrigerate until ready to use whilst we make our cannoli chips. Now, making cannoli dough from scratch is a bit of a fussy affair. You can click the link in the upper right-hand corner right now if you want to see how to do it yourself, but it requires a lot of time and special tools and perhaps worst of all, patience. A great workaround for something like cannoli dip I've found is frozen wonton wrappers. You can buy these at your local Asian grocer, and once they are defrosted and patted dry, you can cut them into decorative shapes. And then just like you would real cannoli dough, deep fry them at 360 degrees Fahrenheit for two to three minutes, flipping once halfway through until they are golden brown and crisp and dappled with beautiful bubbles. Likewise, we're gonna drain those on paper towels to keep them crisp, optionally adorn our cannoli filling with extra miniature choco chippos, surround with our tender, crispy cannoli chips, serve up and watch them disappear. You could also dust these with powdered sugar if you wanna class up your Italian chips and salsa dessert, but I think they're plenty pretty just as is. I hope you guys try these for yourselves and have a great big game celebration day. Happy team, go sports. This is the year we're gonna go all the way. Thanks again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's episode. They've been a great partner in supporting the Babish Culinary Universe and bringing my websites to life. From websites to online stores to domains and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform for you to build your online presence. They also have SEO tools so that your site is getting found and searched by more people more often. If you want to try it for yourself, you can start your free trial today by visiting squarespace.com babish to get 10% off your first purchase.